next speaker, Dr. Sharon Hesterly. Um, she is the Chief Research Officer at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. She has over 20 years of neuromuscular research experience, including leadership roles in patient advocacy groups in the industry. Um, she's been involved in rare disease gene therapy programs at Pfizer and served as uh, CEO of Lion Therapeutics, bringing so much expertise to the field. Dr. Hesley will today uh, give an overview of the drug development landscape in CMT. Dr. Sharon Hesley. Okay, so I know we're running a little bit behind. I'm going to try and get us back on track because I'm going to be relatively brief. What I want to do is do a sort of 30,000 foot view of what the therapeutic pipeline looks like right now. And then um, I know that the later sessions plan will dive into more detail behind disease mechanisms and targets and types of therapy like gene therapy. So um, I'm gonna give this a start, but before we start first, let's see. The green arrow button, right? Good. Nope. Somebody might need to help me advance the slides. It's not. No. Nope. There we go. Okay. So we're going to start a trip back in time because I think to understand where we are now, it really helps to appreciate where the field started. So imagine the flashing lights and the smoke. We're going back in time. Um, somebody might need to advance this if it's not going to go. There we go. Okay, so we're going to imagine the world of 2013. So if we just look back briefly 10 years ago, Barack Obama was president. The tragic Boston Marathon thing happened right here with the um, uh, bombing there. Um, exciting things like the word selfie became part of the dictionary. So, and the Pope signed on to Twitter. So just to give you an idea where we were 10 years ago. So in the world of CMT, there was very great excitement over 60 different forms of CMT that have been identified, 60 genes associated. Um, ascorbic acid had just failed in Europe and we were awaiting the outcome in the US. Um, people were starting to talk about things like um, progesterone, uh, antagonist HDAC6, trophic factors, um, curcumin, these were all under study preclinically. There were drug screens underway. People were looking at PMP22 suppressing compounds um, and starting to speculate about gene therapy and how to actually get uh, vectors into um, the right place in the periphery. So if we look back a little further, so we're still, we've gone back in time again. We look 10 years back when George W. Bush was president and we had uh, just invaded Iraq. Um, Friends was the most popular TV show on the on the air and the Human Genome Project had just com been completed and was being celebrated. So in the world of CMT, it was a little bit simpler. There were 18 genes identified and 11 candidate loci. Um, there was a lot of time devoted to trying to understand the pathology behind those mutations. And I think that's still happening, an ongoing process. Um, people are looking at antioxidants um, and these really exciting, really crazy novel biologics like um, siRNA and antisense RNA were starting to be discussed as potential solutions. Um, there were some early experiments even with um, adenovirus as opposed to adeno-associated virus, which is more commonly used now. Um, and then one more trip into history, Bill Clinton was president. We're probably now at the point where some people in the room weren't born. Um, you know, the average price of gas was $1.13. Um, the World Wide Web had just started, believe it or not. And I was in graduate school complaining about not being allowed to use a diamond knife in my sections. And I will say that I had sections in my dissertation and they were all cut with a glass knife and I'm still bitter. Um, in the world of CMT, this was a pretty exciting time actually. So back in, I uh, should say 1993 at the top of that, um, that was when the mutations in PMP22 were first identified. And this was all done through sort of positional cloning it was done the hard way. Um, there was an excellent form known, but the wasn't really clear exactly what that was at the time. And um, there was a lot of excitement around the identification of PMP22 and sort of starting to understand how that led to disease, that duplication. 
Um, and there was a belief in the relentless power of new technologies, which is what was quoted at the end of uh, one review that was written at the time. And I think that's what we've seen follow through. So we were leaving the past and going to the current time now. So just looking at the CMT re research landscape. So where are we in 2023? There have been over 100 genes identified that are um, associated with CMT. There are at least 20 industry or NIH drug programs underway. I say at least because if I couldn't find it on the interwebs, I'm not going to talk about it here. So what's in the public domain? I know there's probably a bigger pipeline behind that, and I think that's very encouraging. So that's about 14 preclinical uh, stage programs and five clinical stage programs. Um, targets primarily CMT1A is sort of the primary target, which isn't surprising given that it's the most common form. Uh, CMT2A and then several other forms of CNT behind that that also have therapies directed. And they span the gamut from small molecules, gene therapy, stem cells, siRNA, antisense oligos. Um, and just to talk about how we got here, um, we heard a little bit about SMA and the investment the community had made into research. Um, the same, I think, um, is true, and it's what you're seeing now, and the progress that we're seeing currently is because of investments by this community. So, you know, the MDA has invested over $42 million in CMT research over the years, and strategic investments by CMTRF and CMTA and the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation, I think, are really bearing fruit now, and starting you're starting to see these things get pushed in an accelerated fashion because of that follow-on funding, um, and it's really critical, so... So this is what we're looking at for CMT1A. Just to start there, you can see that there's a very rich and deep pipeline. Um, in green at the top, we have things that are sort of um, upstream. So the highest level, decreasing PMP22 expression is where a lot of the activity is focused, and it makes sense because that is about as far upstream as you can get in this disease as, as far as addressing the root cause of um, overexpression of PMP22. But you can see behind that, there's a whole lot of things uh, devoted to other mechanisms, whether it's stem cells to straight out replace one cells, um, decreasing calcium influx, stress response, so the integrated uh, stress response or um, UPR is being addressed. Um, Schwann, general, some general things like Schwann cell survival and axonal regeneration, growth factors that might be useful across multiple uh, multiple diseases. And I'd say growth factors have a long and storied history of failing repeatedly over and over and over and over and everything. It's possible that one of the reasons they failed is they aren't getting to the right place. They have short half-lives or they're not in the high enough concentration. So delivering that kind of thing through something like gene therapy might make a difference. So, um, you know, uh, other things that are, you know, really uh, under investigation are the HDAC6 inhibitors, which might help with axonal transport. It might be useful across a number of different forms of CMT um, and others that you see here. So I think the point is just to say, I'm not going to go into all of this because I think you're going to hear more as we go, but there's a very rich pipeline. Um, for CMT2A, um, the same, the most you know, focus has been upstream on things that affect the root cause of restoring function of MFN2. Um, but there are some other things that are more general um, that would be applicable across multiple diseases uh, that are in development. And then also in these follow-on uh, therapies, I think we're pretty excited about sword deficiency. Looks like it really might have a very good chance of being successful. Um, and then some of these others, I think we'll talk a little bit more, but CMT4J is actually the subject of the um, NIH Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium. So that's another one that's very exciting. Um, and speaking of gene therapies, just very briefly, so I'm not going to go into this because I know we're going to have a talk about gene therapies later, later, but there is a lot of interest and a lot of focus in developing gene therapies for these different forms of CMT. And there's at least preliminary work happening in laboratories around the world um, over here. And it's every kind of gene, gene replacement, blocking gene expression, as we so often need to do in dominant diseases, um, gene editing, or even just you know, in some cases, overexpressing downstream genes. So it's not the gene that's affected, but it's something like a growth factor that you might be able to overexpress and have a wider benefit. Um, so just a quick look of what's actually in clinical testing right now. There's a couple that I included that are in early phase one, um, but I think we're all waiting to see the readout of the PXT3003, which is a combination therapy 
of baclofen, naltrexone, and sorbitol. Um, that's in phase three. It's the second phase three the company has conducted. It's um, just completed, and they're anticipating a readout in uh, Q4 of this year, hopefully. And I also saw that the uh, company has just announced uh, this week, actually, that it's looking at various licensing deals. So it's not uncommon for a company to say, you know, set up these deals to actually um, uh, commercialize the drug in different countries or different areas. So we should see some activity around that, that we'll have partners soon to help them do that. Um, you know, the, the applied therapeutic study uh, is an aldo aldose reductase um, inhibitor that um, is being tested. And that's a, you know, those aldose reductase inhibitors are fairly well known. And so that's why this was sort of an exciting finding that it might have an impact. They're doing a phase two slash phase three, um, which suggests to me that that might be considered registrational, but I would have somebody from the company comment on that. Um, there were some other interesting things. There's a plasma gene therapy study going on in Korea. So uh, Helix Smith is doing that and they've got two forms of HGF on this plasmid. Um, that they say has actually um, has RMAT approval um, in the U.S. So that's an FDA regulatory sort of special approval that gives them a little more um, access to regulators. Um, so that's an interesting study to watch. Again, it's a growth factor, but you're delivering it very directly. So it might have a, a larger impact. Um, you know, these uh, integrated stress response uh, enhancer. So Inflectus is studying that for across a variety of different forms of CMT. Um, and the idea there is they're blocking a compound that would normally turn off the stress response. And by keeping it on longer, it helps sort of bolster the cellular activities. Um, and InView Pharma is doing an exploratory study, they say to understand if there are synaptic transmission uh, deficits in some forms of CMT. And if there are, then they would look at this uh, chloride channel inhibitor they have that helps with synaptic transmission. So that's very early stage, sort of exploratory. And then there are a couple of these HDAC6 inhibitors in investigation, again, looking at improving axonal transport. And then the last one I found, again, is a Korean country, a uh, Korean company that is doing a um, iPSC-based uh, stem cell therapy um, for CMT1A. And there wasn't a lot of information about that. And it looks like it's pretty early stage. Um, so that's what's going on in the clinic. It's a pretty interesting pipeline. And you saw what's coming along behind it. That's quite a lot too. And I guess in the question is in the future, what could we look for? I mean, I think combination therapies are what we're going to start seeing. Um, Dr. Sumner showed, you know, some examples of that is happening in spinal muscular atrophy. We can see it in our mover database because we track medication use for people. And we can see that a lot of people have had at least two medications and sometimes all three, not at the same time, but um, so that people are definitely able to combine these therapies. And I think we'll see that there's unlikely to see this, uh, even with gene therapy that people talk about as a cure and a one and done. Um, I, I don't think that's likely. I don't think anybody in the field really thinks gene therapy is going to be a one shot, one and done cure that we're probably going to want to combine it with other therapeutics and even figure out how to retreat, but I'll save that for the gene therapy discussion. Um, gene editing, of course, and then there are other things. And I don't have a slide on this, but I'll just leave uh, with one thought too. So MDA is an umbrella organization. We cover, you know, neuromuscular disease writ large, and that's about 350, 360 genes and counting uh, individual diseases that we were looking at. And a lot of the more common ones, you can see it with CMT1A. You're starting to see a lot of therapies and time devoted to those, but the majority of what we cover and the majority of the forms of CMT are ultra rare. And we sort of loosely define that as affecting less than a thousand people in the US. And so we've been asking ourselves, what can we do about these therapies? What do we do about, um, we don't wanna leave anyone behind either. And so we have started internally a program that we call Kickstart. That is um, a gene therapy program designed to focus on these ultra rare diseases and get some momentum there. And one of the questions is how do you scale that? We can do them one off forever and it will be a hundred years before we get through these. Um, but what we're doing is really documenting where the roadblocks are with the goal of having a white paper. So whether they're regulatory roadblocks, manufacturing roadblocks, and of course the commercial um, roadblocks and so that we have something to contribute if there are changes to be made on the regulatory side. So the next time there's a PDUFA reauthorization we can come in with a plan and say, this is specifically where the roadblocks are. 
that if you require three commercial batches of gene, you know, of a gene therapy to approve a disease that only affects 40 people, that's not viable. So uh, we're going to try and document some of these things. The other thing that we will do is work with single disease organizations um, to partner and to see if we can do multiple of these programs in parallel. So get some economies of scale by sharing things like regulatory expertise, project management, um, CRO, master service agreements. And so we've started with one that's a congenital myasthenic syndrome because we wanted to tackle what we thought was the lowest hanging fruit to have a success. And that's a disease that um, is uh, presynaptic. It's an enzyme um, involved in the production of acetylcholine. And these uh, children are pretty severely affected. It affects their breathing. They have episodes of apnea, but their nerves aren't degenerating and their muscles aren't degenerating. So if we can just get that signal working again, we have a good shot at proving that. And we did look at a form of CMT as our first one out, and it's still one that we're thinking about. So as we have money to do more of these, we will be interested in getting suggestions and we'd be happy to partner. So I'm going to stop there and hopefully we've gotten us closer to back on time. And I think that was it. Yeah. Sorry, I know you're you were trying to wrap up at the end, but I'm curious, how exactly are you trying to see, so you identify internally the most promising mm -hmm treatment areas and then how do you are you then looking for a, a you know biotech or industry partner to take it yeah. on how, how does it work yeah so we've identified this congenital myasthenic syndrome so we're working with a partner at uc davis um it's dr ricardo maselli i don't think we've done a big announcement but it's not secret um we're in licensing the ip from uc davis slowly but surely um and then the goal is we will get this project through an inflection point, the first one being a pre-IND that's that's really informative so that we have all our I's dotted, T's crossed, and we have the data in great shape to take it to the FDA so we get good feedback to plan the IND enabling studies. Yeah, so we're doing that in-house. We have, a, we have a team doing it in-house. We are looking at spinning out Kickstart as, a, um, as its own entity, but right now it's all in-house. And then we will look for a partner at some point. We started with pediatric disease because from a commercial standpoint, you have the potential to get a rare pediatric voucher. So that enhances the commercial probabilities a little bit and will help us find a partner, we think, to take it to the next level. But we're also talking to companies. I've been in Boston here talking, you know, doing the rounds and um, all these, almost every company where I've been, there's something that's in the pipeline, very deep that everybody loves but knows is not commercially viable. And so we can partner with companies. If you have things in your pipeline like that, um, maybe we can take some of the burden of moving those forward, so. That did work. Okay, yeah, sorry, two questions. Uh, one was also related to uh, what Charla was presenting. When uh, companies are kind of collaborating or looking to mix therapies is that something that naturally progresses or is it something that needs to be actively pursued and how can we promote this mm -hmm. and then the second question was one online about are there any therapies uh, investigating CRISPR in the CMT field okay I'll answer the first one uh, first and that is sometimes they progress naturally obviously companies are always out scoping out other technologies or looking for good fits for partnerships but they can't know everything. So um, often they're helped along by people who are making those connections. A lot of times it is, you know, nonprofit organizations in the space because we kind of talk to everybody. Um, so, you know, we can serve as matchmakers, but some of it happens on its own. Some of it always benefits from a little push. The second question I can't answer, which makes it really easy. Um, off the top of my head, I did come across some, a couple of CRISPR uh, Cas9 programs, and I think they were on my slide, but I don't know the details of those. So yes, and probably more that I don't know about would be my short answer. 